Welcome to Pleasant Green Sunday School. This is Lesson 8 for July the 24th, 2016. We begin a new unit today, Unit 3, entitled Life on God's Terms. Our topic for today, taken from the Adult Quarterly, is God Hope. The devotion read is taken from Psalm 42. Our background scripture is Romans chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 11, and we'll be studying today uh, in the fifth chapter of Romans, uh, verses 1 through 11. Our key verse reads, Hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. <clears throat> It's taken from Romans chapter 5 uh, from the King James Version. Our lesson aims today, number one, is to hear Paul's encouraging words about peace, endurance, character, hope, and love as gifts given by God through the death of Jesus. Number two is to appreciate the reality that God's provision of the Savior is God's continuing commitment to God's creation. And the third aim is to be able to take hope through Jesus Christ in the difficult times in life. We have three outlines today that we will be uh, discussing. The first one is entitled Peace and Hope. The second outline is entitled Christ Died for Us. And the third outline is entitled reconciliation. We certainly thank and praise God for uh, the privilege and the opportunity to be able to share another word with you from our Sunday School lesson. We have been in the book of Romans. Uh, we started out in the first chapter. We have made our way through uh, to the fifth chapter in today's text. Uh, we hope that you are studying uh, with us uh, some theological principles, the basics, if you will, of our of our salvation, um, faith in Jesus Christ, and what it means uh, to us. The overarching theme of uh, this discussion or the lessons that we have had uh, deals with law versus grace. Uh, we have had a survey uh, from Paul's perspective on the Gentile world, uh, the Jews, and uh, all of humanity. But today we want to uh, talk a little bit about, uh, at least through these verses in the fifth chapter of Romans, verses 1 through 11, we want to focus today on what the believer has. You're going to see that in these verses today, or what we have. Um, what we possess as believers um, of Jesus Christ. And that's very important that we understand this because there is a, wa uh, a war going on, as we all know, uh, as we are told in uh, Ephesians chapter 6. But the war is on for our hope. Uh, there's so much hopelessness in the world today uh, and there is a war, uh, and because we have possession of these things, uh, the benefits, if you will, through our faith in Jesus Christ, the enemy would love to steal your understanding, to steal these things away from you. I, I, I want to note something that the Apostle Paul uh, stated to Timothy. Uh, in his writings to him, he says, fight the good fight of faith. And as we uh, uh, understand and have taken hold of Jesus Christ through faith, there's going to be some fighting. Uh, some fighting of what you understand, what you believe. Keep that in mind. Our biblical context for this lesson, in today's lesson, Paul continued his discussion of justification from Romans chapter 3, 
while he introduced the subject in Romans chapter 3 and Romans chapter 5 Paul shared some of the benefits of being justified through faith for believers those benefits include peace reconciliation and hope one of the Greek words for peace referred to the prosperity and order made possible by the absence of war or open conflict this definition offered an external perspective on peace New Testament writers expanded on this definition to include the inner peace experienced when in a right relationship with God additionally there is the promise of peace with God but not peace among nations peace with God was only made possible through reconciliation reconciliation brings about a change that restores harmony between persons or more significantly between human beings and God Christ's sacrificial death on the cross made reconciliation possible still it is up to individuals to accept Christ through faith and be uh, reconciled to God a couple of definitions I want to give you concerning hope uh, as it uh, the question is asked here in uh, the topic of this lesson but uh, the definition of hope is a trustful expectation with reference to fulfillment of God's promises but the uh, biblical hope definition is the anticipation of favorable outcome under God's guidance I want you to look at uh, Romans chapter 10 uh, verse 11 that tells us having such biblical hope and expectation of the fulfillment of God's promises uh, leaves the believer not being ashamed or not disappointed. So we want to keep those things in mind. So as we begin with this first outline entitled Peace and Hope from Romans chapter uh, 5 verses 1 through 5 I want to read this from the King James Version therefore being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God verse 3 and not only so but we glory in tribulations also knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us so what is Paul saying here therefore uh, that word simply tells us that we need to go back and we need to see what Paul has said from Romans chapter 1 through uh, Romans chapter 4 about what the believer has so we reach a conclusion now or, uh, of, of a coming together uh, in Paul's uh, theological perspective concerning what the believers have if you have faith in Jesus Christ if you are a believer today uh, I want you to read this uh, and understand what you possess and it will help you understand why you are struggling or why the enemy is attacking you if you think about what a thief does in practical terms uh, a thief targets someone that has something that that individual does not have uh, and so that thief tends to seeks to take that uh, to possess as his own uh, from someone who is in possession of something it works the same way in the spiritual context we have the devil knows that as believers and this is a a good sign I've said this for years that when you're under attack by the enemy you might want to take note that that is maybe a good sign for you to understand that you are being attacked because you have something and that's what Paul is saying here uh, therefore being justified you are right with God you have been made right with God you have been justified if you will 
by faith based on what you believe what you have accepted the testimony that God gave concerning his son you now have peace and we're going to talk about that a little bit because there's a struggle in the world for security uh, for peace purposes um, but I want you to read John 14 27 we're going to share some scriptures with you as we go along and I also want you to read Ephesians chapter 2 verses 14 through 18 but we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom verse 2 says uh, also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. This is the foundation of where every believer has been put by God through his spirit and through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. But as we looked in this first outline as it uh, tells us that uh, uh, peace and hope is, is what we are talking about. We are talking about spiritual peace. We are talking about a sense of well-being and fulfillment that comes from God and is dependent on God um, or on his presence, I should say. So this is the peace that we are talking about uh, that as a uh, uh, you read in John fourteen twenty seven, Jesus tells his disciples, My peace give I unto you. The world cannot get this. The reason why the world can, cannot get this type of inner peace is because it has rejected the testimony. It has rejected the doctrine. It has rejected Christ's sacrificial death as atonement for their sins. I want you to read Isaiah chapter 57, 21. He says, there will be no peace for the wicked, no spiritual peace, no inner peace. But the believer here, in contrast, has been justified. And we also have access by faith into this grace that is a portion to us, not of our doing. God just gives it to us. We have access to that. So that is unlimited, unmerited favor that we have uh, with God and from God. Verse 3 says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations uh, uh, because we understand the process. And as we get into this outline, I want to share some things with you about suffering. This lesson will point that out beautifully for us. And then we will give you some scripture to help us understand that tribulations have a purpose. Uh, in our lives. Uh, James in the first chapter of his gospel. He says count it all joy. Uh, my brethren. Who is he talking to? He is talking to believers. Uh, uh, that understand that, that tribulations have a purpose. Uh, this is something. And you know I can say this now. Because I understand it better. But that was a time. That I did not understand the purpose of tribulations Paul says this is what you should get from it uh, the tribulation is working patience uh, I've heard Christians over the years say that they were praying for patience I want you to understand how you're going to get it you're going to get it through tribulation so when tribulations come it's working a spirit of patience in you that's very important because as God uh, will give us to understand he works things out in his own time uh, and in for his own reasons and for his own glory and so on and so on so we need to learn how to wait and suffering and waiting on God to do something for you will teach you patient expectation then patience brings about experience uh, those of us in the body of Christ, uh, those of us that have been saved, what you have now is experience with God. And how did you get that? How did you get that experience with God? You've been through some things in your life. So you're able to encourage others that, that it will work out in God's own time. And not only uh, is experience at work, but experience 
in matters in tribulation is bringing about hope. Keep in mind those definitions that we gave you. And then verse 5 says, And hope make it not a shame. So you waiting on God uh, will not uh, uh, render you hopelessness uh, or render you in a position where you will be disappointed. Uh, and maybe you may not get the tangible thing uh, from the circumstance or that you expected God to do, but you will mature in Christ. Keep that in mind. You will grow. Uh, if you look at the spiritual component of what you have gone through, uh, you, would, you will be in a better place than you were before. In other words, you would have learned something through that experience. And this is what God wants to teach us. He says, hope make it not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. And we need to understand why we are filled with the Holy Spirit. He is a comforter, our paraclete, our intercessor, our standby, if you will. And he comes to us and encourages us uh, uh, when we are going through. Uh, uh, I wish we would stop saying as believers something told me or something said to me, something uh, uh, gave me a song. Let's put a, a name on the individual who is at work uh, uh, in us. It is the Holy Ghost. So here, any time we see a therefore, we must pause and consider what is what it is there for. In this instance, Paul reminded his readers of what he had shared from Romans chapter 1 through verses through uh, chapter 4, especially the unrighteousness of all humankind and God's path toward his free gift of justification by faith. Human beings were God's enemies. It took Christ's redemptive work at Calvary to reconcile humankind to God. It brought peace with God. Peace with God has profound implications for believers. We now have access to God's grace, his loving kindness in action. We have a new status with God. We now stand in God's grace. You know, this is huge. Uh, back over in the first chapter when we began our study of the book of Romans, um, and I want to go over there because I believe this will help us understand going forward uh, as believers how we have to live. You know, I, I think that it's critical uh, for us to understand. In Romans chapter 1, verse 17, Paul writes, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, catch this, the just shall live by faith. Now, the question is asked, how is faith obtained? In Romans chapter 10, Paul writes, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So what does that tell the believer? How much word uh, gospel do you need to live by? Or a better question would be, do you have enough gospel in you whereby you can live? And this is important for you as a believer in your study habits and in your prayer life. Uh, since God has put you in a new position and you have to now live by faith tells me you're going to have to be armed with the word of God whereby you might live. If you don't have or if you're deficient in God's word, it frustrates the life that God has set forth for us to live. I hope we understand that because by nature of faith, it comes from hearing God's word. I, I think it's critical that we uh, uh, don't throw away opportunities for the environment of the teaching and the proclamation of God's word. I hope we're not robbing ourselves of the opportunity to study God's word. When we talk a little bit uh, as we get into this lesson about suffering, one term that you want to make sure that is not applicable, applicable to you is 
is self-inflicted wounds. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But Paul goes on to say here, uh, during the time of Paul's writings, that many of his readers and listeners were under severe oppression by the Roman authorities. So talking about peace might have seemed very unrealistic to them. That is why Paul focused on the notion of inner peace. In that way, those believers' hope for the future was rooted in the ability to handle life's adversities. The same thought holds true for us today. That is why Paul boldly proclaimed, we also rejoice in our sufferings. You know, it, it's one thing to uh, 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 rejoice when you're where you want to be and the sun is shining on your side of the street. God has answered all of your prayers and so on and so on. But when you're going through a trial and you're going through a tribulation and you can still praise God in the midst of of that suffering. If I can and, and might, I want to share a personal note with you uh, because when I read this, it, it brought about an experience that I had some years ago uh, when the Lord uh, took my first wife and uh, I was in shock. Uh, we were praying for her to live, but God saw fit to take her, and it, it you know, it made me very angry. Uh, I have to be honest about that. I was angry with God. I was angry about how the circumstance had turned out. And I remember um, walking down the street and I was still grieving and I was hurt and I was shouting at God. And I said, you took my wife. And God spoke back to me and said, I gave my son. And that put put me where I needed to be spiritually. It put a different perspective on my thought process. So when we talk about sufferings, uh, we want to, uh, don't want to minimize what you're going through, but God has a purpose for our lives. And it was difficult for me to see that purpose at that time. But it goes on to say here, since Jesus has already shared how believers would suffer. I want you to read Matthew chapter 10 verse 22, Luke chapter 21 verse 16 and 17. It was not whether but when believers would suffer. Don't let anybody tell you you don't have to go through anything once you become saved. That is the biggest lie that ever been told. I want you to read 2 Corinthians chapter 1, all of it, and you will see. First, it would produce these sufferings would produce perseverance perfect perseverance produces proven character character that has been tested and approved second corinthians chapter 8 verse 2 i want you to read that and also philippians chapter 2 uh, verse 22 what i'm doing today in giving you these scriptures is arming you uh, that you might be able to relate to what the Bible says about what you're going through and that you're learning a biblical principle and foundation for your sufferings. It's not what everybody else says is what God says. Uh, so we have to keep that in mind and this is how we have to live by what the Bible says about our sufferings, about what Jesus has said about our tribulations and trials. Uh, uh, in the 16th chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus tells his disciples, In this life, you will have tribulations and trials, but be of good cheer. We know these things, but when we're going through, it's difficult to see them and to understand uh, why they are taking place. But when God sets out to establish you and to work a work in your life, he will accomplish that. You should understand that. I should understand that. He will bring you uh, Hebrews chapter 12 helps us to understand that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. One translation says the perfecter. He starts it. 
uh, he initiates us to believing in him and then he is able has the power to bring you uh, and me and bring our faith where it needs to be and tribulations play an intricate part of that process I note and I want you to note what Jesus went through back over in uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 12 the Bible says that Jesus endured the cross he endured it he went through it I also want you to read Hebrews chapter 5 all of it he cried out Jesus did he wanted out in the garden of Gethsemane he prayed that this cup would pass but he learned back over in Hebrews chapter 5 the Bible says he learned obedience through the things that he suffered if you're going through because God has allowed something to take place in your life and it's not self-inflicted learn from it if you can't through prayer if God seems that he won't stop the trial at least you can learn from the trial keep that in mind so as we go on proven character produces hope the calm assurance of God's deliverance such deliverance might be removal from the suffering or getting inner peace in the midst of suffering I want you to read Philippians chapter 4 verse 7 what gives us this inner peace it is God's Holy Spirit that he has given us through his love for us keep that in mind it's his Holy Spirit so this is the reason why we have it when I said that the Spirit of the Lord reminded me of John chapter 17 you may want to read all of that uh, as well because in Jesus prayer for his disciples he prays to the Father he says I pray that you take them not out of the world don't take them out of the situation or the circumstance or the environment that they're in believe them in it but keep them that's very important for us to understand the question here in the quarterly is when we read verses 3 through 5 however you have you actually found yourself rejoicing in suffering feel free to share your thoughts I want you to read Peter's epistle verse uh, Peter first Peter and second Peter because Peter talks about types of suffering and he specific uh, I believe in the fourth chapter of first Peter about not suffering as an evildoer or as a murderer those would be self-inflicted types of suffering things that we have caused being uh, meddlers and, and other men's affairs and these types of things uh, uh, so we want to make sure that we're not overstepping the commandments of God and causing uh, 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 suffering undue suffering to come into our homes and in our lives in the lives of our children people we say we love that's very important for us to understand but he goes on to say Peter that if we're suffering as a Christian we should not be ashamed I encourage you to read that today our second outline is entitled Christ died for us this is taken from Romans chapter 5 verses 6 through 8 I want to again read this from uh, the King James Version verse 6 for when we were yet without strength in due time Christ died for the ungodly for scarcely for a righteous man will one die yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us we keep talking about sin and the position that we were in uh, in relation to what happened in the garden uh, and that problem even though Adam and Eve had been put out of the garden the sin problem remained in humanity in the world in God's creation God was never pleased with that arrangement so the second Adam or the second man or Christ if you will when you study 
of the book of Galatians. The second Adam, or Christ, came to rectify the sin issue. Uh, being born of the Virgin Mary, uh, lived apart from sin. There was no darkness in him at all. He was brought into being by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so as God's son, he became the atoning sacrifice or the propitiation for the sin, the human kind issue a broken fellowship with God and through his sacrificial death the shedding of his blood on Calvary he restored and redeemed humanity that the relationship that was lost in Genesis could be restored through Christ so this is why Paul is saying while we were yet sinners it doesn't matter when we came on the scene we were born in sin Psalm 51 and we were shapen in iniquity and in sin did our mothers uh, uh, conceive us and so we needed Christ so while we were in our nature of sin Christ was dying for humanity. So in this passage, uh, probably only second to John 3.16, you remember that very well, in conveying the depth of God's love for humankind. That, you know, we have to understand that all of this uh, uh, theology, if you will, through the Apostle Paul and others, and in these principles and fundamentals of our faith, is rooted in love. God so loved. He loved you. He loved me enough to fix this problem of sin that we could not do in and of ourselves. You remember as we said the overarching theme of this lesson was law versus grace. So when we go back into Genesis chapter 15 we learn that Abram believed in God and it was credited to him uh, uh, as righteousness and as we move into the history of Israel and the commandments and the statutes and the ordinances and everything that they try to live by in terms of keeping the uh, uh, a holiness code if you will of the character of God they failed miserably so Christ came in the fifth chapter of Matthew he says I did not come to destroy the law or the prophets but I came uh, to fulfill so we technically are not under the law we are under the grace dispensation but we should be products of the law in other words the law should have led us to Jesus Christ I hope you understand that so you should be the fulfillment of the Old Testament Mosaic law I should be the fulfillment. Israel should be the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So this is the reason why uh, uh, Christ didn't come to destroy, rather to fulfill. So if we are disciples of him, we should and we represent by faith and what he has done, we are the fulfillment of that righteousness or of that law, if you will. I hope you understand because Paul is explaining this uh, in great depth uh, that God demonstrated his love for us while we were still sinners Christ died for us so humankind had a sin problem God had to wait until just the right time uh, I want you to read Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 God had already preordained when the first coming of his son would happen. All of that was through the law, through prophecy, uh, to fulfill that which he had said. If you read Luke chapter 2, Simeon and Anna, they were uh, in the temple, the Bible says, they were waiting for the consolation for, uh, of Israel. Uh, they were waiting on the fulfillment of 
of the law. They were waiting on the fulfillment of the prophecy concerning the Messiah that would come. And so it had been prophesied uh, through the Holy Spirit to Simeon that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Christ. And that's why he was where he was supposed to be in expectation that God would fulfill the promises that he made to him. I hope you understand that Luke chapter 2 read it for yourself so it goes on to say human beings were powerless to save themselves the power of sin was too strong there are many people today who believe they can fix their problem when I get myself together you will never be able to get yourself together when I fix one problem six more uh, uh, erupt in my life you will never be able to sin is too strong for us to handle of ourselves we do this thing we live this life through faith and what Christ has done Jude tells us in his benediction now unto him who is able who is him Christ Jesus he is able to keep us from falling we are unable to keep ourselves additionally the law could only reveal sin but not deliver from sin in verse 7 Paul shared how rare it would have been for someone to die for a righteous or good person. Yet, from a human perspective, we could understand someone doing that. The righteous person would have been worthy of someone's dying in his or her stead. But that was not the case with humankind. The most amazing aspects of Christ's sacrifice is seen in the words, While we were still sinners. This expressed the immense depth of God's love. Can you imagine God looking at us and saying, they are not where they should be. They are still sin sinful. I, 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 when I read the story of Israel, and I know you do, these folks uh, always, always disobey God. They were never consistent. But you know what? God never abandoned them. Even today, you read Romans chapter 11. They have not, Israel, the Jew, they have not been cast off totally because God made them a promise. He is in covenant relationship with the believer. There's absolutely nothing that anyone can do about that. And they will always be. So God is going to bring them, bring you, bring me where he wants us to be because he chose us. He selected us. In the third chapter of Exodus, if you read what God says to Moses about those individuals that was in bondage, he said, I am ready to deliver my people. I am come down. I heard them. They've been calling on me and I'm going to bring them out. And he tells Moses, when you get them and you bring them out, you bring them here to me. And so this is important. We were chosen by God for this salvation. And Romans is an excellent book to study to illustrate these things uh, for us. I want you to read the eighth chapter of the book of Romans. But here the question is asked in the quarterly how can we live lives reflective of the price that was paid for our salvation? This is a huge discussion in our culture today. And as we wrestle to explain this, do you know we are holy? Do you know that God is holy? Do you know we ought to live lives that are pleasing in his sight? Doesn't Jesus tell us, tells us that in the 11th chapter of uh, Matthew he says take my yoke up on you and learn we have to learn the things that please God and because of the sacrifice you and I are special in God's sight we are in uh, 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 the type of individual that he will not forsake he will not abandon and so it is with great effort Many times I pray and I thank God for his efforts toward my life. He demonstrated in my life that he loves me. He demonstrated to me that he wanted me to be a part of this thing. He brought me out all by himself. 
He rescued me from my sin. That sends a strong message to me. Don't you know where God has brought you from? What does that tell you about how God feels about you? He brought you all the way so you could take part in such a great salvation. The book of Hebrews calls this a great salvation. And it is. The second, the third outline is entitled Reconciliation. This is Romans chapter 5. Uh, verses 9 through 11 again from the King James Version the Bible says much more than being now justified by his blood catch this much more much more much more than being now right now put in right standing justified uh, I want you to read Psalm 32 by his blood by the blood of Christ we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now the wrath is going to come and be visited upon those who reject the knowledge of the truth. Those who reject his great salvation. Doesn't Psalm 91, can, if I can, let me just read a little bit of that. Because we want to get a glimpse of much more of what Paul is saying here uh, in his gospel but I want you to be encouraged by this this is Psalm 91 is talking about safety of abiding in the presence of God of God verse 1 said he who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty Verse 2, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the, from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and and buckler verse 5 you shall not be afraid of the terror by night nor of the arrow that flies by day I'm gonna stop right there but I want you to continue to read all of that just because we dwell in the secret place we shall abide under the shadow of the almighty that's where we are as believers we are depending on the presence and the power of God we are depending on God to keep us the thing that Paul says in Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 he that began a good work in you shall perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ much more than much more it's so much more we could go on and say about what we have but I want you to get a glimpse of this thing because we have been put into right standing with God through the blood of Jesus Christ we're going to be saved we are saved and eventually we will be moved from the very presence of sin Isn't that beautiful to know from the wrath through him Romans chapter 8 verse 1 helps us to understand even better read that verse 10 for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life verse 11 and not only so but we also joy through our Lord let me back up we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we now received atonement or reconciliation in the NIV translation I want you to read 2nd Corinthians uh, chapter 5 and let, listen what Paul says to the church of Corinth about this reconciliation but I want us to understand what we have I want to help us to understand you are in possession of so much more than you and I could even talk about we have so much more than uh, we could even think about we have so much more. 
that God has in store for those who love him. But being justified by the blood of Jesus, we are saved from God's final judgment. That is a great hope for every believer. Paul once again reminds his readers that all humans were God's enemies. We were God's enemies not because of what God had done but because of humankind's transgressions. Despite being God's enemies we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. Resulting in the opportunity for salvation for everyone who believes in him. Let me just say this. Don't pass this up. This is so great. I find it interesting even in the Old Testament uh, passages. We go back over there and read about Israel's history. God brought everyone out of Egyptian bondage. But everyone didn't make it into the promised land. I want you to read 1 Corinthians chapter 10. All of it. And 1 Corinthians chapter 10 it tells us why some of those that God brought out of Egypt didn't get into the promised land they failed to get into the place that God had prepared for them they died in the wilderness in various ways but in our day so many are trying to get around Jesus Christ Jesus says in the 14th chapter of John I am the way and the truth and the life. He said no man. No man comes to the father. But by me. We all have the opportunity. For salvation. Through faith. In Jesus Christ. But we're living in a culture. Where we are trying too many paths. And none of them will net us. To the place that God has prepared for those. Who love him. We will die in the wilderness and not reach the promised land, the place that God had prepared for those who love him. Jesus says, I go away to prepare a place for you. And if I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself. We have a great opportunity and I want to stop here. And admonish those of you who are listening, don't pass this up. I'm going to go a step further and I'm going to beg you to give your life to Christ. I'm going to make a biblical appeal to you to be reconciled to Christ. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I urge you with everything in me to let Christ rule your life please I beg you don't be deceived God is not mocked Galatians chapter 6 whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap I beg you today as an ambassador representative of Jesus Christ a witness a voice crying in the wilderness give your life to Christ it has so much beautiful benefits attached to it but in like fashion this same God will pay you to your face if you hate him that's what he told Israel those that hate me I will pay to their face. We have a chance to escape the wrath that is to come, that we see every day that is coming up on us because of our disobedience. Paul says that in the first chapter of the book of Romans. So I hope that I have encouraged at least one soul that does not know Jesus in the pardon of their sins to give their life to Christ how do I do that preacher very good question I want you to read Romans chapter 10 
but I will share this with you. I want you to confess after hearing this gospel, and then I want you to follow that up with Ephesians chapter 1. I want you to hear the gospel. I want you to confess with your mouth. And I want you to believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. The Bible says you will be saved. Our closing prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for your presence in our times of trials and tribulations. Your presence gives us hope even in what we believe to be hopeless situations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There was a term as I close that the saints would say as I was a boy growing up in the church. They talked heavily about redeeming the time. They wanted us to understand that time was precious. And we needed to buy up every opportunity to make good on the time that God has given us. That being said, don't let another day go past without you accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Just know this, Jesus loves you, and I do too. And until such time that God will permit us to come together again, we say God bless you.